Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this morning, I would like to present to you the Fugerei project in Augsburg, um, which is the first example, we could say, of affordable or social housing in Europe. The project of the Fugerei in our Augsburg signals a noteworthy departure from the predominant housing types for the poor in Europe uh, during the Middle Ages. And while medieval charitable uh, foundations were, were based on what uh, Bronislaw Jeremek defined as the economics of salvation between the founder of the institution who donated to redeem their soul and sins and the recipients on the other hand, who in turn prayed for their savior, a change in the motivations behind the establishment of charitable institutions can really be detected in the context of early capitalist development, the new religious ethos of the Reformation, and the rise of the high Middle, Middle Ages uh, bourgeoisie. And the roots of this new impetus uh, are to be found in the changed perceptions and attitudes towards poverty that are so typical of the 15th and 16th centuries, which on one hand led to the secularization of poor relief, and on the other, to the legal, moral, and social definition of what was considered acceptable versus unacceptable poverty. And these changes, I believe, are really reflected in the architectural manifestation of uh, new poor relief institutions, for example, that of the Fugerei. In his seminal article on typology, uh, Rafael Moneo asserts that the emergence of a new type should be considered a tangible signifier of uh, changed architectural and historical circumstances. And so in response to this statement, this presentation will argue that the Fugere in Augsburg should be held up as a case in point of typological innovation. But most importantly, that the Fugere can also be seen as one of the first examples of typological design, in which type is used as a project to define a specific subjectivity. Built in 1523 by the Fugger family and often regarded as one of the first examples of uh, social uh, or affordable housing in Europe, the Fugger was established to accommodate uh, the so-called house arme or shame-faced house poor. Um, and since the 13th century, this term, the house arme, was used to describe uh, either those who had fallen into a condition of poverty for no fault of their own, so for example, due to a condition of sickness or old age, or also those who were industriously working but were experiencing um, economic hardship and so were threatened by poverty. However, during the 15th and 16th century, this category becomes one of the only acceptable forms of poverty, as it sadly entailed that the poor subject was still a productive member of society. The Fugere's type, made of standardization, repetition, and structural promotion of familial privacy, signals a deviation um, from the previously established housing types for the poor, such as, for example, almshouses, um, beginhofs, or medieval hos hospitals, as it really provides a new solution to a new contingent problem, its deserving house poor inhabitants. And so in this sense, the Fugerei can be, can be seen as a paradigmatic example of a shifted attitude towards poverty. In fact, while um, previous poor relief institutions were usually designed to house single individuals in a communal setting, here in the Fugerei project, uh, we see that it is newly catered to accommodate families in the most private manner. And so this pivotal change is, um, I would like to argue, symbolizes an awareness that to maximize um, the working class efficiency at the workplace, the reproductive labor performed behind the closed doors of the home should be considered an essential and necessary prerequisite. So in this presentation, I would like to discuss three uh, key architectural transformations that materialize this novel typological approach, um, namely, first, the emergence of the boundary wall as a uh, preventive enclosure, Secondly, the removal of the square and the, the road. And finally, the advent of affordable mass housing. But first, I'd like to quickly expand on the social category of the house arme, which the Fugerei was designed to house. So the emergence of this um, category can be understood as the result of not noteworthy changes in the perceptions of poverty, which began to occur, occur between the 14th and the 16th century throughout Europe. 
It is widely accepted uh, among scholars that during the Middle Ages in the Western context, poverty was understood as a form of rel relative deficiency, and therefore it was a permanent characteristic of societal structures. And so in this sense, poverty could really affect anyone regardless of their economic status uh, or social situation, as the word in itself simply implied a lack of something or even a religious choice uh, of refusal uh, or, or material of material possessions. But between the 14th and the 15th century, um, the semantic acceptations of the word poor and poverty start to gain a negative connotation. And in the context of Augsburg, where the Fugere project was to be constructed, the city's growth as the top mining uh, and, and fabric trade centers center uh, resulted in a marked polarity between the wealthy and the impoverished. And so in beginning in the middle of the 15th century, the authorities started to control the dispersal of alms, of charity, in tandem uh, with stricter regulations of the guilds uh, to ensure the peace of stability of the urban context. Beggars started to be seen as a threat to the bourgeois uh, working class values that were gradually taking place in the public realm of Augsburg. And so the legal efforts to label and control the poor uh, began to gain traction ever since the 15th century. And this is really testified by the multiple poor relief uh, policies that were published throughout Europe almost all at the same time. And through these legal frameworks, the poor were for the first time described as commensurable legal subjects whose behavior could finally be regulated and controlled. And so following the Protestant Reformation and the secularization of poor relief, um, various uh, relief institutions were organized to a strict, uh, according to a stricter hierarchical stratification. So it's really not a surprise that during this period, the very notion of poverty began to pose a loud threat to the praise the necessary concepts of hard work and of private property. And in turn, as work started to be heavily regulated, the very forceful methods and conditions imposed on laborers instigated, on the other hand, a reframing of the refusal to work as a criminal offense. And so in this sense, um, I think we can really understand the poor subject as a social and economic misfit of this context. And so as it was not possible to fully eradicate poverty, new categories to describe, to describe forms of destitution began to spread. The poor jobless individual was seen as a dangerous criminal who needed to be regulated, while the working poor, among whom were the house army, um, were perceived as honorable members of society who were considered worthy of help. The founder of the Fuggerei, uh, Jakob Fugger, was a German Catholic mining entrepreneur, banker and merchant. And throughout his career, he became one of the most well-known and successful entrepreneurs in Europe. He was a major exponent of industrial capitalism, and he made his fortune in Europe, and particularly in Italy, where he stayed until the end of the 15th century. Um, after the loss of his two brothers, um, Jakob Fugger initiated plans to establish a foundation for the house uh, poor, as it is testified in the first foundation letter of 1521. The Fugere settlement was erected in less than 10 years under the tutelage of the Augsburg master mason uh, Thomas Krebs and 52 houses occupied by 102 uh, taxable Catholic citizens had finally been completed by 1522. The location um, that was chosen for the Fugere was the rural area of Jakoberforstadt, uh, which at the time had only been recently incorporated within the city walls of Augsburg. And instead of building on land that the Fugger family already owned, uh, Jakob Fugger really decided to purchase seven new plots of land through the account of St. Ulrich, which was the actual uh, owner of the company. So despite its predominantly agricultural ca uh, character, the site of the Fuggerei was well integrated within the surroundings. Um, and for this reason, the Fugerei should not be understood as an independent settlement outside the city, but rather as a craftsman affordable housing complex that depends on and interacts with the, its surroundings for economical and social exchanges. The complex is enclosed by a boundary wall with four entrance gates. And within the scheme, uh, there are present 10 rows of houses, which follow almost an unvaried and repeated architectural pattern. 
Their uh, austere and unassuming facades really remind of the Venetian Casa Schiera or terrace houses, which uh, Jakob Fugger, the founder, must have known very well following his stay in Venice. In fact, multiple elements such as windows, doors, ceiling beams, and roof trusses were standardized across the Fugere. And together with the shared partition walls, this really contributed to minimize cost, um, guarantee ease of maintenance, and also simplify the building process all in all. So within the Fugere are 52 single family flats. Um, and the tenant uh, of the flat on behalf of their family um, was required to pay uh, a rent of uh, one florin per year for the Fugger family. Um, for, for, uh, from the, um, sorry. <laughs> and also they committed themselves to praying daily for the Fugger family from the comfort of their own private sphere, their own home, to not engage in banging activities and also to maintain a decorous car, uh, behavior. One of the most outstanding features is the Fugere's boundary wall. Um, in fact, the, the complex is surrounded by this uh, boundary wall with two gates and two gatehouses, which make up the four main entrances to the complex. Three epitaphs and the coat of arms uh, of the founder are displayed at these entrances. <laughs> and this was a very common um, um, feature of domestic foundations in the Middle Ages. The entrance and exit of the inhabitants uh, were strictly dictated by opening and closing times, which were locked between uh, 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. The boundary uh, wall feature was common in other medieval poor relief institutions, such as uh, the court beguinages and hofies, which uh, usually developed outside of the city boundary walls. In fact, typologically, court beguinages, uh, like the one in, in Me Mechelen, um, Bas uh, varied vastly in size, ranging from smaller arrangements um, to large architectural complexes that were often um, named court beginages. And these were usually separated from the neighboring urban establishments by the means of walls or moats. As noted by two, um, two of the main scholars that studied the Fugere, um, Tietz, Strödel, and Scheller, in the case uh, of the Beguinages, the boundary wall had a defensive aim and was constructed for security purposes, since really these institutions were outside the city walls. However, in the case of the Fugere, the boundary wall assumes a new function. It has been argued that the Fugere boundary wall should be viewed primarily as a bearer of meaning, um, basically a figurative device of the settlement's identification and representation, because it really did not have a defensive feature since the inhabitants were economically reliant on the surrounding city. Um, and Scheller has added to this thesis that the Fugere boundary wall with, with, with its precise opening and closing times was also a physical boundary between the order um, of the settlement and the disorder of the city, between honorable poor citizens and dishonorable poor mendicants. And so in this sense, the boundary wall um, of the Fugere really acted as a tool to discern moral and immoral behavior. And so it became a reminder for the inhabitants that they are part of a community of like-minded individuals who chose industriousness and morality over begging and unsocial behavior. The Fugere complex was also designed to get rid of any form of commonality. In fact, a square of co or a courtyard is completely lacking throughout the entire complex. The only semblance of an intent to create such a space is given by the presence of a fountain in the intersection of two main roads, uh, the Hinteregasse and the Mittleregasse. However, this fountain um, was a later addition of the 17th century. And for this reason, we cannot analyze this space as such. Seven narrow roads ranging from 4.85 meters to 8.85 meters break up the ryth rhythmic pattern of the Fugerais row houses. And their purpose is primarily distributive, as tenants were able to access their dwellings through these streets. However, no square or common place of gathering is present for the inhabitants of the Fugere to meet up, gather, or even protest. And this architectural feature signals a sharp and intentional departure from other uh, relief institutions of the time. In comparison, for example, the almshouse type uh, always included a central courtyard, as individual dwellings were arranged around it, while also beginages fe uh, featured a square with a fountain or other common amenities uh, as a space of gathering. 
for example, in the case of the Bruges Peguinage that we see here, um, despite the fact that dwellings are accessible, accessible from a road uh, in a similar fashion to the Fougueray, at the back, uh, an open space consisting of a common garden is present. Even more contemporary examples to the Fougueray, such as the 12 dwellings for the poor of the Corte Elando Correri in Padova, were arranged around a central open space, um, which created a sense of typological interiority and community. In the Fougueray, the space of a square is instead given up to the individual uh, and private gardens behind each dwelling, reinforcing, um, reinforcing the opposition uh, between the private sphere of the house and that of the community. In a sense, this choice uh, reminds more clearly of today's housing estates, or of, of a few years ago, um, which are based on a logic of conglomeration and grouping uh, of all houses within one compound. And in fact, the avoidance of a space of commonality marks the intention of the founder of the Fougueray to reinforce the importance of the private sphere and to circumvent the fear of rebellion and organized gatherings through a conscious design choice, a typological choice. Lastly, one of the most innovative features of the Fougueray is to be found in its sheer size, uh, which far exceeded uh, that of other contemporary housing schemes for the poor. In fact, built, it was built to cater for over 100 tenants. Um, and as I mentioned before, it was comprised of 52 dwellings upon completion. Each of these dwellings occupied one floor of two stories double apartment houses with a separate entrance. The living area uh, was around 45 square meters overall, and 43 out of the 52 houses follow a completely consistent and standardized ground uh, plan and design. In the remaining nine houses, very minimal variations have been introduced, uh, but mainly this is because of the site topography or conditions that imposed uh, these, these minimal changes. On the ground floor, um, the front entrance is close to the center uh, of the standardized ground floor plan, and a narrow straight corridor runs through all the way to the backyard entrance. Um, the entrance to the first story flat instead leads to a staircase which reaches the floor above, and uh, the ground floor level and the upper floor level are almost identical. The kitchen and the living area are separated, but located next to each other, uh, since the kitchen served as the primary source of heat for the living room furnace. Um, and each ground floor house is equipped with a back garden, uh, which is not visible from the street. And this garden was um, very often used for practical undertakings, uh, even despite its modest size, and less so for recreational activities. Um, and due to its location, the garden is isolated from the community and can be understood as a completely private and familial area. The housing rows are built as close as possible to the property boundary and are arranged in a rationalized and effective manner to provide as many dwellings as possible. And for this reason, uh, we argue that the Fougueray should be understood as a mass affordable housing scheme. The architectural features present in the elevations showcase a repetitive, standardized, and uniform pattern, which is also readable in plan. Um, when compared to other foundations and housing organizations for the poor, for example, almshouses, or again, the specific example of the Cortelando Correr, which is on the screen, um, these were very often designed to not exceed the apostolic dozen um, rooms, 12 cells, one one-roomed houses, or 12 dwellings. There was a really strong importance given to the number 12, um, signaling the religious motivations of the founder. However, in the case of the Fougueray, um, it was designed for a very large number of needy people in a closely similar fashion to the medieval care of hospitals. However, the difference really lay in the provision of single family dwellings rather than individual cells uh, within a distributed um, institution of care. And so one of the main uh, novelties of the Fougueray complex is, that, is to be found in it being a residential foundation for needy families rather than just needy indi individuals. And in this sense, the family again is given a really crucial role in guaranteeing the welfare of the individuals within it. So it becomes a form of support. The unitary, repeated, and standardized arch architectural style of the Fougueray's facades become a symbol of the foundation's purpose of, and identity, highlighting its separation from the surrounding urban fabric. 
It communicates that it is indeed a foundation built to house a specific group of individuals in a socially equalizing sector, set, setting um, who are dependent on the foundation. And so to conclude, uh, the Fugere project can really be seen as the crystallization uh, of a moment of threshold in which type is no longer born out of the customary development of the dwelling history, but rather type here is a, to be understood as a real project, a project of social housing, uh, the first typological housing scheme in Europe that was institutionally ideated by the Fugger uh, founder. And here type is really used to produce and reproduce the subjectivity it houses. It proposes itself as a solution to house and tame the house poor and to educate them to the notions of domesticity, privacy and work. So in a similar way, we could say to the second typology of the modern, modern movement, as described by Widler, the Fugerai's typological domestic nature, or born out of uh, abstract and generic dwellings, uh, and repeated standardized and uniform uh, architectural patterns um, implied its uh, reproductibility and anonymity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Um, and a really, yeah, really clear, interesting example for me, which, which, what, what was running through my mind is that, yeah, so that's very low. Sorry. I think what was what what's very very clear about the example as well is that we see this movement towards the herbs from the mm -hmm. civic in a sense, and and I, I mean it's I, I really I think it's very clear. <clears throat> In the form and the way you talk about the the architecture, so it's a yeah, it's a great piece of work. I think maybe a few things because I'm not so familiar with the context. For me, it would be really interesting and useful to understand this con the wider context at the time, just briefly, because for example, to one question I have is whether or not how these people ended up here. Uh, yep. how this urbanization happens, let's say, uh, what compelled people, because we know, you know, in France and, and England that often it was, it was by force. It was not, it was not a choice mm -hmm. to, to be in this kind of situation. So I, I don't know the, the context that well. Yep. And, and I think then, yeah, so I think this, that's one aspect I would appreciate knowing more about. Another one is really, there are traces of this um, ritual life surround. We see certain uh, symbolic uh, religious mm -hmm. aspects to the, you know, um, ornamentation, etc. So, for me, what was also curious is the is the pattern, is the form of life in relation to the immediate context somehow. So, for example, to the church, mm -hmm. to you know, did if these people worked, where did they work, for example? Yeah. Um, you mentioned it's they were all miners or? They were craftsmen of oh. various kind. Can I, is Sorry, it okay? Sorry, I don't know if I yeah, yeah, I just. Actually, yeah, no, thank you so much for the questions. I mean, um, especially I think the first one is extremely important because there is one more layer to this uh, social category that I haven't mentioned in the presentation, which is the fact that in the context of Augsburg during this time, uh, craftsmen for um, purposes of um, taxation had to uh, have an address, had to have a house. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the fact that uh, this foundation provided an accommodation meant that people could continue practicing their craftsmanship. And so this, of course, made it extremely appealing, it also because the rent was uh, very low compared to uh, the rent of the time. Actually, uh, it was really the category of poor artisans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So artisans that were less successful than mm -hmm. poor rich artisans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Seems like an interruption in your answer. No, no. I think I what what you tried to say is this kind of contextualizing the things what we got a little bit out of this, and as I'm let's say also less in this kind of of deep historical knowledge. I just visit once, I think it was Pienza of Pius the second, which built an idealist city, let's say 50 years before, where also was an intention to do a, so he built also this kind of 12 social housings there, uh, because there was this kind of changing point in, let's say, in, in recognizing the world in this Renaissance time, and just before the Reformation also, which is a kind of very important moment. I think that was your interesting part also that you also tried to explain the urban setting of the of the, of the <laughs> thing there. Because I would also be interested how this is influenced by this kind of changing point of, of Reformation just before the Reformation, because that was the moment, let's say, where in kind of, in that's based in Europe or let's say in, in the or European, European culture, that where the like the fugger and these craftsmen were start to to attack the church mm -hmm. by by discussing what is the value of something what they produced or what is the value of the environment etc what is the value of social places and um, and this influenced I think crucially also urban planning and architecture in a certain way because I think as we are requesting uh, the place in front of the church is not more the place where the Pope comes out and he tells us the value of the shoe, uh, and then uh, the 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 craftsman it sells the, the shoe with the value what the Pope said. That the craftsman starts to tell, no, I made the shoe, I know what's the price of it, and that is a crucial moment also in this kind of development. And maybe it influences also architecture. It could be, maybe in this kind of we have examples like in Copenhagen or so they built uh, then after the, the the Reformation this kind of social houses. And that's the question where this kind of shifting point is in link with, in the contextualizing, let's say, in the interpretation of religion, somehow. Because if we look into the Fugger example, it's still very Catholic mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. And uh, and that is an interesting shift in between, let's say, uh, European uh, reading and in 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 belief or in politics, and somehow let's let to call it politics, and this liberation of things and influences of trends. I think that would be maybe add or to compare it. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think it was a very good presentation, but I, I would also be interested in knowing the difference between uh, Catholic and Protestant uh, dealing with the poor. Mm -hmm. I was also reminded, well, this is a personal anecdote. My grandfather was also very poor and during the, as a child during the Second World War, uh, were very cold winters so his mother went to the catholic priest of the village and the priest said uh, to the mother of my grandfather uh, you should pray to god and he will warm your house mm -hmm. so this kind of um in a way maybe this meaningful theoretical mm -hmm. um uh, instance of showing that it's not necessarily the 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 obligation of of others to to deal with the poor. So I, I, I would be interested to know also, as Martin said, in terms of the reformation, how the uh, religious debates concerning mm -hmm. dealing with the poor. There's just one remark to add. It's not only the Catholicism and Protestant, there's also another one which happened in Germany. It's kind of, it called Gilden. Mm -hmm. This is kind of yeah. guilt, uh, and they established laws against this kind of, uh, of belief, let's say. And they set it up also today. We have the shopping stores with the closest. So all of this is coming from there. And this was another social, uh, let's say, field of, or let's say, network. Mm -hmm. That was the Instagram of the time, uh, let's say, uh, and to establish also values in a certain way and different mm -hmm. manners. And I think this influenced also this kind of what you said, that they're very poor people. And, and there was also a moment when this starts to settle up a second social level in between the so there were maybe you talk about the third social level that is this but that is kind of maybe also to hunt for information there yeah thank you thank you so much um yeah uh congratulations for the presentation and for the work it was really super interesting and particularly what i really enjoyed is the fact that you are telling us about the 
the typology of the apartment, I mean, it's not really called it apartment, but let's say the unit, uh, but also the urban morphology. So that to me was really striking because having been interested in how houses are formulated actually from within, seeing such an early case where on the contrary, uh, uh, kind of really formal intention from, you know, from the urban, from the point of view of the urban morphology, mm -hmm. meeting actually the, the idea of strategizing the house from within, uh, that was really, really striking because it's something that, in fact, actually we will not see again, probably until the modern movement, I, I would guess. And it's done actually with an extreme awareness. Actually, I really like the conclusion when you call you call it type as a project, but I, I find it particularly striking, really, that this is not only actually uh, a kind of, you know, scalar thinking that comes either from the small to the large or to the lar from the large to the small, but it's both of them at the same time. So I'm really curious to see how this will evolve and eventually also in your uh, in your uh, research in general, because we know that the two points of view are not necessarily always aligned. Even when we talk about the concept of type, we know that there are authors that look at type more as a kind of morphological construct, more from the point of view of the city structure, for instance, I'm thinking Rossi, for instance. And there are obviously other authors uh, uh, more probably firm, firmly uh, planted in the um, in the third typology, I would say that on the contrary, no, sorry, in the second typology, that on the contrary, uh, see, it, uh, see it as a question of organizing space actually uh, from within uh, the choreography. So I think the fact that you found such an early example that on the contrary has both of them, uh, to me, it's interesting because it upsets my timeline that, <laughs> that would have thought it actually either going in one direction or the other. Um, and I found that really uh, promising actually a starting point to also interweave probably in your more longer term project. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, and after you can actually reply, of course, we, we, we have time, we have time. Okay. You, you were very, very good in uh, um I just want to add something about the religious uh, issues, which I think is crucial. Mm -hmm. I, I I think uh, uh, it's maybe something worth to highlight more in the, um, also in the paper that uh, you will develop further. Um, in a way, um, the Fuggers were, very close to the Catholic Church. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. the Fuggers were the bankers who organized the, fa the infamous selling of indulgence mm -hmm. to which the Pope uh, was financing the reconstruction of the St. Peter's Basilica. In fact, uh, they were really the, this event was one of the events that triggers Luther to finally come to the conclusion mm -hmm. that there was no hope uh, with the corrupt, corrupted uh, Catholic Church. Um, so in a way, yes. And of course, Augsburg was actually a very Catholic mm -hmm. uh, uh, city, and Bavaria is really the, the bastion of Catholicism against the, the Protestant, uh, let's say, Reformation. But uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, um, many of the uh, ideas of the Reformation were already incubated in Catholicism. Uh, and, and we shouldn't forget that Luther himself was a, a Catholic uh, monk, basically, Augustinian monk. And uh, and therefore, um, in a way, the 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 Fugger, uh, the Fugger is a threshold moment. Is in a way, uh, in a way, it's still uh, within Catholic uh, a Catholic uh, world, let's say, but a Catholic world that already has a mindset uh, that uh, look to the reform to this idea of the Reformation, where people should not wait salvation mm -hmm. uh, in a fatalistic way, but should earn it basically. Yeah. By hard work, and of course, this is a very Protestant uh, 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 idea, and uh, and I think, uh, but of course, is within a, a Catholic milieu. So it's really the moment of of, of threshold, and and it's exactly those this time, the uh, first half of the 16th century, that there, there is a lot of uh, dialectics mm -hmm. uh, between Catholic Catholicism and Reformation. Yeah. No, th thank you so much for all the all the questions and comments, and um, I'll try to go through um, what was said. I mean, of course, I think the uh, Reformation as a as an as a as a long long term event uh, had a huge impact on the organization of uh, poor relief, but also on the attitudes towards poverty, um, and of course. This um, manifests itself in the architecture, in the architectural outcome uh, as well. Um, first of all, the fact that we start seeing all these poor relief uh, um, laws that appear uh, around at the same time in, in Europe, and the fact that we have a strong categorization of the poor subject into multiple uh, social categories. Um, 
but also the fact that, uh, as as also Pier Vittorio was saying, um, it is it is true that the Fugger family was Catholic. However, we see a strong contamination of uh, the ideas of the Reformation. In fact, the the reason why I didn't mention or speak about um, the chapel within the Fuggeria is because this was a later addition. It was never intended to be there, and this was added when the founder was dead already. They had to convert uh, a house uh, to to house this. So, absolutely, it is true. But here we already see how. Um, the the value that is given to religion is already interiorized within the domestic space of the unit um and this really shows in my opinion a, a changed attitude towards towards poverty which starts to um take grasp of the idea of work in a much more it puts work on a pedestal and becomes really the most uh venerated aspect uh, because of course the poor subject puts this concept in crisis it's 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 a rebellious, it's, yeah, in a way, can be seen as a rebellion against this new capitalist ethos of uh, of uh, work. Um, sorry. Um, and then, um, yes, and another thing I just wanted to mention, if there is two more minutes, is that, um, one thing that I didn't mention, but I think it's important, is that the reason, the motivations behind the foundation of this complex um, housing scheme are actually also very personal to the Fugger himself, uh, because due to uh, its uh, almost monopoly on trade in the context of Augsburg, this um, started to create clashes with the city of, of Augsburg, also for uh, taxation issues. And so, of course, we start to see that the motivation behind the creation of foundation like this is not just um, to provide housing for the poor subject, but it is a very um, selfish, in a way, uh, motivation to provide a reason for the city not to um, re rebel against uh, against uh, the work. Uh, so it, it's a very capitalist um, uh, motivation, in my opinion. And uh, I hope I replied to all the questions. I mean. Um, but it was a very interesting discussion and I thank you very much. <laughs>